thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to see this many faces in this audience. It's really exciting. Um, so my name is Chrissy, uh, and I'm a third year PhD student in the Evan Williams group um, in the UC Berkeley Department of Chemistry. Um, and I'm, again, really excited and really happy to welcome you all tonight to our STEM empowerment event. Um, so tonight's event seeks to not only promote the values of equal justice, but also to address the achievement gap that currently exists in STEM higher education along racial, gender, and socioeconomic lines. Uh, so this event actually started out as part of the ACLU call, um, which was a campus-wide grant call from the American Civil, American Civil Liberties Union of Northern California uh, to provide money for Berkeley student groups to bring speakers to campus to advance equal justice um, and free speech. So um, it turns out that we got eight STEM-focused student groups together. Um, and turns out when you get that many STEM-focused groups together, we can combine forces and do a lot of pretty great things. Um, and also gather an immense amount of support. Um, so with that, I want to mention exactly how amazing it has been to receive so much support, both financially and physically, uh, from the UC Berkeley College of Chemistry, the College of Engineering, uh, and the Division of Equity and Inclusion at UC Berkeley. Um, they have all graciously advocated for tonight's event um, throughout the past few months, and it would have not been possible at all without their financial support um, and physical encouragement for this event. Um, so on that note, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Equity and Inclusion, Oscar Dubon, uh, is here. Um, he's currently a professor of uh, material science and engineering at UC Berkeley and our third Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about you, if that's OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> professor Dubon received his Bachelor of Science degree from UCLA um, and both his MS and PhDs from Berkeley after holding a postdoctoral positions at UC Berkeley and Harvard University. Um, so after that, he joined the Berkeley faculty in 2000, and his research currently focuses on understanding the role of crystalline imperfections on the electronic behavior of materials for applications in semiconductor technologies. Professor Dubon is the recipient of the 2000 Robert Lansing Hardy Award from the Minerals, Metals, and Materials Society, a 2004 Career Award from the National Science Foundation, and the 2004 President, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. At Berkeley, Professor Dubon established the Center for Access to Engineering Excellence and has worked to support groups that have been traditionally underserved and or unwelcomed while integrating into broader cohesive framework of inclusive learning communities. For his efforts in this area, Professor Dubon received the 2016 Chancellor's Award for Advancing Institutional Excellence and Equity. His Office of Equity and Inclusion has also graciously helped to fund this event today. So please help me welcome Oscar. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Uh, good afternoon slash evening, everyone. Good, yay. I am truly delighted to be here in, at this event. I am so inspired to see you all here, to see the future of STEM, to see the future of STEM leadership, and to see the amazing. It, oh, oh, give it away, my Oh my God, I'm sorry. To, I want to. Continue. And this is all being recorded. Uh, and, and really to see all the amazing intersections that we call diversity in STEM and in all our fields. Um, I think that's really important and, and what I value the most is to have that opportunity to really uh, I, uh, raise and, and celebrate the fact that we're not just, just one identity, but we're, we hold numerous identities and we, and we need to find space in STEM and other fields to be ourselves and, to sh and contribute to the field with all of who we are, not just one part of ourselves. So I think that's something that I'm really excited about. Um, I've been thinking a little bit around uh, issues around the academy and where we are with diversity. And um, there are a couple of words or terms that I think about that I wanted to share. And one of them that has came up this, uh, this weekend when I was in a panel uh, in, in, um, with, uh, I was honored to be in a panel with uh, Representative Barbara Lee and Mark Desonia is that we talked a lot about structural racism. <laughs> 
and how structural racism is something that, it's a term that makes us uncomfortable, but it's something that we really have to call out because it's something that affects all the work that happens, not just in, the social, in, in, in society and in social er context, but also happens in the workplace and it happens in the academy and how we need to address that is very important by starting by actually calling it out. Gender behavior, gender policies, how do we identify them so that we can address them and find real solutions to these? The first thing we need to do is to call them out. So you are the future. You're going to be calling out all of those important factors that are keeping our, our society from reaching its potential by using everyone's talent and creativity to address the most important challenges that we face. And I thank you for bringing us all together and celebrating that. And I can't imagine it selling celebrated it more in a better way with such an amazing speaker that we have and, and she'll be introduced next by Chrissy. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you so much, Oscar, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Um, so it's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Talithia Williams, who's a professor at mathematic, of mathematics from Harvey Mudd College. So Dr. Williams earned her bachelor degree in mathematics at Spelman College, her master's degree in mathematics from Howard University, and her PhD in statistics from Rice University. She is currently the associate dean for research and experiential learning as an, and an associate professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd. There, she developed statistical models which emphasize the spatial and temporal structure of data. Her professional experiences include research appointment, appointments at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA's Johnson Space Center, and the National Security Agency. In addition to all of that, Dr. Williams has also partnered with the World Health Organization to develop a cataract model used to predict cataract surgical rates for countries in Africa. Dr. Williams is also renowned for her popular TED Talk, Own Your, Own, Own Your Body's Data, in which she demystifies the mathematical process in amusing, in amusing and insightful ways. She's also the co-host of the PBS series Nova Wonders, which premieres in April 2018. And she created a 24-course le lecture series called The Learning Statistics, Concepts and Applications in R for the Great Courses. In 2015, she won the Mathematical Association of America's Henry L. Alder Award for Distinguished Teaching by, beginning, by a beginning college or university mathematics faculty member which honors faculty members whose teaching is effective and extraordinary and extends its influence beyond the classroom. Through her research and work in the community at large, Dr. Williams is also helping change the collective mindset regarding STEM in general, in general and in math in particular. She is currently confidently rebranding the field of mathematics as anything but dry, technical, or male-dominated, and instead is making it a logical and productive career path that is crucial to the future of this country. Um, so I hope you are all enthusiastically awaiting her talk as much as I am. Um, so please help me welcome the amazing Dr. Talithia Williams. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everybody, uh, so I'm super excited to be here and I feel like the longer the intros get, the older I get and so I'm sort of then like, oh, wrap it up, wrap it up. Um, you, you already got a sneak peek, who's this lady? What's she known for? All right, civil rights, didn't give up her seat on the back of the bus, yeah. So we honor her, uh, former President Obama, first lady, have honored her, recognized her. There's a statue of her at the U.S. Capitol, stamped little books, right? And so we recognize her contribution to society. Who's this young girl? It's not me, I'll give you a hint. Back in the day, my glasses were thick. You know, you couldn't pay extra to get the thin. No. Some of you understand what I'm, yeah, now I pay extra. But back in my day, who is that? Anybody know who that is? Mm, not from Hidden Figures, that's a good, huh? I know Catherine. Not quite Catherine, not Catherine Johnson. Her name is Claudette Colvin. Anybody know who Claudette Colvin is? No, never heard of her. Yes. She did what Rosa Parks did. She sure did. She did it nine months before Rosa Parks did. Why don't we know about Claudette? She was 
She was pregnant. Word on the street is she was pregnant. Why else don't we know? Word on the street, because I don't know that that was, uh, uh, I don't think she ever had said baby, but word on the street. What else? Why else do you think we don't know about Claudette? How old was the, oh, I'm sorry. Her age, right? 15. How old was Rosa Parks? Do you remember how old she was? She was in her mid-30s. What else? Didn't work for the ACLU. <laughs> That'll get you in there every time. Uh, colorism. She was a dark-skinned young girl. Her mom had passed away. She was being raised by her father, her and her siblings. And so she wasn't seen as the image. They didn't want her to be the image of the civil rights movement. And so Rosa Parks was, was strategically chosen. She's sort of fair, easier on the eyes. If you look at pictures of when she was arrested, she was immaculately dressed. Right, because it had all been coordinated. But the point I want to make here is that Claudette Col Colvin is in some ways a hidden figure. How many of you got to see the movie Hidden Figures? Yes, did you like it? I loved it. Here's my favorite scene. <laughs> That's how I felt in my defense. I was like, <laughs> for all of you graduate students in the room, FYI. Uh, so this movie highlighted African-American women who were NASA's uh, human computers, worked at uh, NASA. And it highlights three of the women, but there are lots of other women, other white women who were showcased in the movie who also worked as, as human computers. And so how does this connect to STEM empowerment? Um, in the introduction, you heard that I spent summers at NASA, worked at NASA. I, I never knew any of these women, never knew about their story. Never heard of them. I saw the movie and I was like, oh, that, that would have been helpful to know. <laughs> you know, because I'm sort of walking around JPL like, oh, I'm, you know, thanks for having me. You know, and had I seen this, I'd be like, oh, we were here. We have been here. You know, let me tell you, right? Right? And so when I think about this empowerment, it really starts with empowering us with, in our history. Right? The same thing for white women. Had they known, like, you were the computers that operated NASA. You know, what an amazing story. And yet, often those stories are hidden from us. Right? So yeah, this is me in the back. No, nope, let me go before you try to take a picture. Um, <laughs> and so um, I want to just start and tell you a little bit about my story, how I became a mathematician, and then we'll get in some of the data, what the data says around diversity and inclusion and some possible solutions. So uh, my junior year of high school, I got a job as a cashier. And that was back before uh, we had um, cash registers that would do all the you know, calculations for you and tell you the answer. And so I'd be trying to beat my little typewriter type. Anybody? Don't even. Don't. Ah. <laughs> Dating myself. But back in the day, we had to like lift the stuff out of the buggy. You know, Now they make us do all the work, like put it on the conveyor belt. But I was like, oh, yeah, I can grab your milk. Oh, no, it's OK. It's just my back, just my back. <laughs> Right? And so I would try to figure out the change when people would give me their money. I'd try to calculate it before I could punch it in and get the amount from the cash register. So that's what sort of how I started doing mental math. And then um, how many of you watched A Different World? I'm starting to, yes. You remember this guy? Dwayne Wayne. What did he major in? Math. Oh, I wanted to marry Dwayne Wayne. <laughs> He was the first black person I saw with cool glasses, and I'd worn glasses since the third grade. And I was like, well, there's Dwayne, and he did math. And I was like, maybe I'll do math. Um, anybody know where the show was filmed? What campus? Spelman, Spelman College. I went to Spelman. I was going to find him. I was going <laughs> to find him on Spelman's campus. So uh, I want to talk about sort of how, how my first empowerment came, and it came from an Perhaps an unexpected source. My AP calculus teacher, Mr. Dorman, who uh, at the time I thought was an old man in his middle 50s, and now he was young. Let me tell you, he was young, OK? There's nothing old about being in your mid 50s. The older I get, the younger he was. <laughs> in high school, I was like, oh, who's this old guy? No, that's why I put old in, in quotation marks. Right? Um, I took some AP, uh, AP courses, and I took AP calculus. And I was not an amazing AP Calculus student. Um, I was sort of middle of the road, maybe even below. And, um, and it wasn't that I loved mathematics. I loved that in AP courses, you could get a B, and it was like a 4.0. And so I was like, yeah, sign me up. Like, I just get Bs. Um, and so uh, my AP Calculus teacher 
uh, Mr. Dorman one day pulled me to the side and he said, Tilithi, you know, you're really talented in math. You should think about majoring in it when you go to college. And I was sort of like, what, what, really? Because I, I didn't think I was that talented. And in fact, I wasn't that talented. He told everybody that. Everybody got their day. Like, hey, do you know you're talented in math? You should major in it. <laughs> we found that out at our 10-year reunion. And, you know, and we we're like, oh, you too? Uh, but here's why it was so shocking. Because it came from this person who didn't look anything like me. Right? He had nothing to gain by affirming my mathematical ability. Right? It was quick. It wasn't every day he was like, you're so good, you can do it, blah, blah, blah. He was just like, oh, you should think about majoring in math. Not if, but when you go to college. So it's like, oh, wait, you expect, you expect me to go to college, and you think I can major in math. And somehow that was more important coming from him than it was coming from a, a black woman who would have said that. Like, oh, you got to say that. Like, you know, you got to support me. Right? But he, Mr. Dorman didn't have to. This person who looked so different from me had no reason to have to affirm me. And the fact that he did, I held on to that, right? And so I, I make that point because often we think, oh, if I don't look like people, I can't help them. Actually, you're more likely to be a positive influence because I tell little brown kids all the time they can do it. They're like, yeah. And then I'm like, I bump my colleague, go tell them they can do it because they're going to see you and think, oh, oh, you think I can do it. It makes a difference. Um, so I ended up working at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So here's another uh, older white man who was such a great mentor. I was in Lonnie Lane's lab. First time I met him, he was like, hey, call me Lonnie. I was like, I cannot call you Lonnie. I'm from Georgia. If I don't have something in front of that, my great grandmother will get out of the grave. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I just can't call anybody by their first name. And so JPL, was, everybody was on a first name basis. And so I had to get used to calling people with like three and four PhDs just by their, by their first name. Uh, anybody, how many Caltech, any Caltech? I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't ask that. Yes, <laughs> right, so JPL Caltech was connected. Claudia Alexander was my mentor at JPL. And so I met Claudia and I was like, you are so beautiful, I just wanna morph into you, like how do I be <laughs> you? And so she really took me under her wing and mentored me. I didn't do research with Claudia, I researched with Lonnie, but I got, to, got mentorship from Claudia. And so Claudia was sort of the first visible example of what I could become, right? Mr. Dorman were, affirmed me, Lonnie affirmed me, Claudia was visible. It was like, oh, okay, now that I think I can do it, oh, I see her, now I know I can, right? And it made a big difference to actually have that, that image. I went to Spelman to find Dwayne Wayne. And um, at Spelman College, what, was, what I took for granted was that five faculty in our math department were black women. And I just thought every school has a couple black women mathematicians. Like, it wasn't a big deal. And it wasn't until I you know, got to my senior year and started looking at grad school, I was like, nobody has a black woman. Right? But by then, I already imagined myself as a mathematician. I had all these examples. I had examples in chemistry and biology and physics. And it's not that every faculty member at Spelman was a black woman, that's not the case, but there were enough that you could see yourself in any area, and so everything seemed like a possibility. So um, I graduated from Spelman and applied to Rice University and got rejected. Ended up going to Howard, spent some time at Howard, took a stats course, biostats course, and fell in love with statistics and applied again to Rice and got accepted. And so that's where I ended up finishing. Got a PhD in statistics from Rice. You see all these are graduation photos. These are the, this is the happy time. <laughs> I have to come back another time to tell you that process. This is when it's not going to be recorded. But yeah, so I ended up finishing. I mean, you know, I, hey, this stuff lives on YouTube, so I'm conscious of that. Uh, yeah, so, so graduated from Rice, noticed this little bundle of joy that was two weeks old. Oh my goodness. Again, that's a, that's a separate story. Like, how do you have a baby and get a PhD? Um, having the baby was easier than getting the PhD. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> it was like, it'll be over in 48 hours. I don't care. Whatever happens, like, it's got to come out, right? Ooh. <laughs> there was a deadline. <laughs> Either you're going to come out naturally or they're going to cut you out. It's going to be over. <laughs> PhD is like, I don't really know. I'm a six year and maybe in two years I think I might be out. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And now I'm on the faculty at Harvey Mudd. Uh, Harvey Mudd is a math, science, and engineering uh, undergraduate institution in Southern California, one of the Claremont Colleges. Um, oh, HMC in the house. Um, pretty, <laughs> it's awesome. I love it. I love our department. Do you, do you see this diversity? Can you find yourself here? Right there, folks who are gay, straight, Christian, lesbian, atheist, agnostic, Jewish, Jewish agnostic, <laughs> all in this picture. And that's intentional. It's not accidental. Like, oh, we do a search. Oh, my goodness, look what happened. We got some diverse people. Right? It's been very intentional in creating an, an amazing department that looks like the world. Right? We're doing a search right now. And so how can we intentionally create departments that are going to reflect our student body? Because a student that looks at our webpage and doesn't know any of us, we want them to be able to see themselves in somebody in this department. Right? All right, so uh, let's look at some data. Here's what it says. So, so, um, the Department of Education did a study on advancing diversity and inclusion in higher ed. Here's what they had to say. This came out um, a little over a year ago in November of 2016. Higher education is a key pathway for social mobility in the United States, part of the reason all of us are in this room. Our unemployment rate is about 2.5% for college graduates. When you look at Hispanics who've completed, only completed high school, they earn about 30,000 compared to those who have a four-year degree, earn closer to 60. Same for blacks, around 28,000, close to 60 if you've got a bachelor's degree. Okay. So then when you think about what you're gonna pass on to your family, part of it has to do with what you're making on a yearly basis. Right? I can't pass anything on if I don't make anything. All right, take a look, what do you think of the data? Here it is. Anything jump out to you? Let me get maybe a couple comments. What stands out to you? What was that? Hispanics and blacks are lower. Hispanics and blacks are lower. Yep. Show me the data. That's what the data says. What else? Asian and white people make more. That yes, uh huh. That is the opposite spectrum. Uh huh. Yeah. Education is really important for Oh my God! It is. Education appears to be pretty important, right? Bachelor's degrees or more. Right, because when you think about, notice how this high school level, right, you put some confidence intervals around that. Eh. Same for associate's degree, confidence intervals, we're all about the same. Right, bachelor's, you see some, some separation. Right, so that or more is standing out there, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so um, as you get higher socioeconomically, those differences actually tend to minimize. So some of this difference is likely because Asians and whites are getting advanced degrees at a higher level than blacks and Hispanics. Right, so as a high earning African American woman who's a college professor, the likelihood of my children getting a four year degree to me, it's gonna be 100%. Like, you better, <laughs> you better go to college. I will drive you to Harvey Mudd every day, right? You will be in my section, right? In the past 50 years, we've seen racial and ethnic disparities in higher education enrollment. This isn't new, so this is just sort of to set the stage so that we're all on the same point. We see gaps in earning and unemployment, in particular for people of color and also for women. Right, so I don't wanna, I want to make sure that that's on the table as well. Where do we see these leaks in the pipeline at every stage? Applications, admissions, enrollment, matriculation. Right, we're more likely to, to lose underrepresented students. And definitely completion. When you look at completion rates among students of color, right, they tend to be lower on average. What do you get from this data? Percentage of US residents 25 or older getting a bachelor's degree or higher by race and ethnicity from 64 to 2014. Anything standing out for you? The gaps are not closing or close? Closing. They're not closing. 
what happened to Asians in the 60s? <laughs> right? I'm sorry for the Asians in the room when we were not collecting that data. I just, just want to apologize on behalf of our country for not being intentional. Um, yeah, so, so this data is from the Department of Education. Don't ask me, but I noticed that too. I was like, mm, come on. We can do better. U.S., we can do better. <laughs> Anything else jump out? Yes. significantly, right? They're not climbing at the same rate, even though there's sort of these slight increases. Where's the population growing? Right, the minority population is growing. So we've got more people that are at a lower percentage over time as well, right? Back in the 60s, it was a, right? Everybody was low, but the population was, was different than it is today. All right, any other comment? Anything else you wanna jump out to you? In general, it's low overall, right? Even if we, right, half of Asians, a little over a third of whites. So two thirds of white residents 25 and older don't have a master's degree is one way to think about it, right? So think about everything that you're getting in your education in those four years and how that changed your perspective your life perspective, and then think about someone who doesn't have that experience and what their life perspective might be. Okay. High school graduates enrolled in post-secondary education. Ooh. What do you think? What do you think? What stands out to you? I'm gonna come back here to the back row, because I know I see, yes, hand on the background, that's what I'm talking about, yes. What does selective mean? Yes, what does selective mean, highly selective? Competitive institutions like Berkeley, Harvey Mudd. More likely to go to less selective schools. Why do you think that's the case? Finances. Selection from other schools, yep. Ooh, more minorities, less prestigious. I see a hand here and then here. Expectations, familial, Sure, familial expectations. My family was happy when I graduated high school. They were like, okay, well, if you, you know, that's all good if you want to, yeah. Access and resources. Access and resources, right, yes. Confidence. Confidence. What do you think? How do you fix that? All right, that's our conversation. How do you fix it? All right, it's part of partly low expectations, right? If we give kids equal high expectations, they will perform where we expect them to. And if we expect them to go to community college, that's, that tends to be where, where they go, yeah. Diverse high school teachers. What's the problem with that? We don't really pay teachers well. I mean, you know, like which, who, who wants to go teach high school? It's, it's, right, yes, okay. But the rest of us are like, well, you know, if nothing else works out, you know, I mean, right? So how do we really encourage talent, talent to go into high school teaching? Let's get one more, there was a hand in the back. Yes, sir. Oh my God, right? My students confide in me like, Prof. Williams, you know, um, I love being a Harvey Mudd, but like, I don't get this whole let's buy pizza when we're on a, a meal plan. Right? Something as simple as, oh, let's, get, let's all go in for a pizza. And it's like, but we could just go swipe at the cafeteria. Right? And so how do you have that conversation when it's just a couple dollars? And so it's hard for some of my students to even recognize that socioeconomic privilege that they have. And it's not always majority students with minority. Right? A lot of my minority students come from great high schools and have resources. And some of my first gen kids are white men from the Midwest who, who don't have five bucks to throw into the pizza pot. Right? And so how do, you, how do you have that conversation at an institution? This is great. What are some institutional solutions now that we're here? 
All right, this isn't stuff that I made up. This is sort of stuff that people have done. All right, what could we implement on our campuses? All right, so we got some faculty in the room. We got some administrators. We have future faculty and administrators in the room. So as you think about where you're going to be and where you're going to work, first, how do we reach prospective students? We're pretty good at that. Right? We, we, we're sort of getting better at reaching them and bringing them to campus. Harvey Mudd is doing better at that. Right? We're struggling when it comes to this institutional commitment once they get here. Right now that they're here, we're like, oh, check, yes, we brought, oh, diversity, inclusion, thank you. <laughs> right, and then so what happens to these students that you bring to campus when there aren't resources? You know where they end up? In my office. <laughs> In my office. People from other campuses, students I've never taught before, come meet with me. I can't close the door. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. You, are you HMC? Can I see your ID? Right? So if you don't have it, they're going to then tax the few faculty that you have in order to get it. And it's not just students of color. Female students come. Gay, male, white students come. It's like, who can I identify with that can understand what I'm going through on this campus? And so we talk about a tax. Oh my goodness. Like it, it is a huge burden for the few faculty and staff of color when there aren't institutional resources in place. So then the goal would be how do we diversify across all levels of an institution? Like how do we recognize that tax? And even if, even if we can't go out and hire five new faculty of color, how can we consciously train current faculty to be thoughtful and intentional in their classroom? Right? <laughs> There's my, my amen corner back there, like, you better preach. <laughs> right? Because think about who were those old white men who, who mentored me? Right? They didn't have to look like me to have an impact. Right? So, how can we encourage our faculty to do the same? And then, so, and then lastly, how do we then bring in diverse and inclusive faculty? We're doing a search in Harvey Mudd. And so uh, in the cover letter, it says, um, so we ask for a research statement, a teaching statement. And then we say, in your cover letter, uh, talk about ways that you've broadened participation in the mathematical sciences or ideas that you might have. So everybody can give an idea. Right? Idea gets you to check the box. Okay? It gives graduate students and postdocs who have really been thoughtful and even done things a chance to shine. Oh, I was a Sockness. I took a group of students to Sockness. You know, I'm aware of this issue because we want people coming to our campus who are going to be thoughtful about that, in addition to amazing research, in addition to excellent teaching. Okay? You can say something like, I think my next door neighbor growing up was Native American and we were friends. And that would count. <laughs> right? The bar is low. We're, you know, we're just like, okay, 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 you said, you know, I mean, you know, everybody's had their experience. But you've got to say something. And the first year, what was challenging was you know, being at the table with colleagues who were like, oh, I've got a great applicant. Well, did they talk about diversity? Well, you know, they forgot that part, but. All right, well, if they had forgotten their teaching statement, we wouldn't. All right, and so how do we, you know, if we value diversity, how do we show that we value it? How do we measure that value? We redid our re reappointment tenure and promotion guidelines to include inclusivity and diversity work as part of scholarship. Not just, oh, thank you for that extra service, but you're three grants short. Right? So how do, we, how do we then, because we tell people, we tell faculty we want them to do it, and then it falls on your faculty of color, and then when time comes for promotion, it's like, oh, you know, you were just so close, but. So we, re, we change the guidelines so that we could measure what we say we value, right? Instead of thinking everybody needs to come through, the, you know, once you get tenure, then you can do. That's not going to excite junior faculty who are graduating today. It didn't excite me. I was like, I'm going to do what I love. And if that gets me tenure, great. And if not, well. But I can't not do what I'm really passionate about, right? You want people to come and do their passion. 
right? Students know how they feel on campus. Do we take the time to ask them? Collect that data, right? Cultural competency training. Nobody wants an additional course requirement, but maybe everybody needs to do something in new student orientation that says, hey, we're coming to a different environment. How can we all get along in this environment? Right? How can we have some of those hard conversations up front and be intentional about it? How do we create support systems that are gonna address the need? Right? We got them to campus and now we don't help students flourish. How can we as an institution be intentional in doing that? And not only that, make sure they're visible, they're accessible, that students are a part of that process. Not, oh, yeah, it's in the back corner on the basement level, there's a person who I think can help you, right? No, no nobody's gonna use that. Right, how do we make these resources available and prominent? And then lastly, financial support. When you looked at those graphs and you saw those disparities, a lot of it was just because of socioeconomic status. Right, we can meet need, but students still may not have five bucks for pizza or money to buy books. And so there's sort of this need that goes unmet or, oh, your parents are expected to contribute 2,000, which seems like a, a, you know, a small amount, but students are like, my parents aren't gonna, I don't have $2,000. Now I know they're expected to, but it's not gonna come to this campus. Right, so how can we have some of those hard conversations right, as we think about financial need? Okay, fun story. So um, when I think about STEM empowerment, I think about how we all touch the next generation, whether that's through um, friends and family or even our children. And so I really try to empower my boys to get excited about STEM. I got three little boys there. Um, we love Christmas. We do Christmas big, like we're in the <laughs> Christmas play, you know, angels singing in the choir. Um, <laughs> But this year, we, ha we had a death in our family. Papa, Grandpa, passed away in November. And so we were like, let's just go to Georgia for Christmas. Like, let's sort of outsource Christmas, you know, because he, he'd live with us. And we just kind of wanted to get away. So we went, spent Christmas with my mom. She put up her little tree, little skinny tree. I said, Mom, we're flying. We can't do a whole lot of gifts. She got some gifts, small gifts, and go in a suitcase. Great. So I was like, this is perfect. Nice. Don't have to buy a whole lot. And you know, and then my son asked me um, those three words that every parent hates to hear. Is Santa real? Is Santa real? There's a young person in here, so I'll be, I'll be conscious of <laughs> where I go with this story on the back row there. Okay, and so I said, what do you think? <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> um, I don't, you know, <laughs> tell me, son, you're nine years old. And, and so he says, um, I think grown-ups eat the cookies and milk, but I don't know. How does he get to every kid's house in one night? <laughs> I guess I believe 51, 52%. <laughs> 51, 52. I kid you not. And so in my mind, that's my boy. <laughs> that's my boy, right? And so then I calmly tell him, look, son, don't forget your margin of error. <laughs> okay, you can't, you can't just throw numbers out like that without a margin of error. So no, no, plus or minus, plus or minus. I've taught you better than that. Okay, so data science, right? STEM empowerment begins at home. I could have just been like, meh, you're gonna find out one day. Right? So then he gets with the seven-year-old and they start talking and the five-year-old is sort of sitting and he's like, you know, we need, to, we need a way to figure out if Santa's real. And I'm like, whose children? And so they were like, <laughs> they're like, well, since we're here in Georgia, if we have gifts in California, that means Santa must have stopped at our house. And so they're like, yeah, oh, that's a great idea. We can, see. you know, and so, so they're like, you know, this is some private thing. Like, we can see if we've got gifts, and then we'll know if Santa. Swim. So they were doing a hypothesis test, <laughs> right? No hypothesis. Santa's not real. Alternative, he is. <laughs> and so, what was the decision? What would you do in this situation, given that we have a little child in the back who probably believes in Santa? 
we got in touch with the neighbors and had them get in touch with Santa <laughs> so that Santa could make sure that he'd left presents at our house and let Santa know where the key was so that Santa <laughs> could get in the house and deliver. And so here we are. <laughs> so they run in the house and we're like, oh, you know, we're sort of like, dude, dude, they're like, oh my God. They're screaming, they're like, come look. We're like, what? How did this get, wait a minute, right? So we're gonna take up money uh, for, um, for the therapeutic services that my children are gonna need <laughs> later. But in the meantime, right? I mean, I could've, we could've just ended this. Right? We didn't have to go through this. But think about how we're raising the next generation to be thoughtful about collecting data, thinking through processes, right? Coming to a conclusion based on evidence, right? <laughs> and yeah, albeit. <clears throat> it was a type one error for those of you who are statistically literate. Um, so, <laughs> uh, let's talk about the ways that we can work in the community and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up pretty quickly because I want to get to questions. Um, I really, so when I got to Harvey Mudd, I didn't see a lot of students who looked like me, and, um, and yet we were in Southern California. So one thing I really wanted to do was invite them to our campus and try to build a pipeline, right? And you know, how do I get local girls of color excited about the possibility of coming here, recognizing that uh, when you look at that data and you wonder why that community college data is so high, a lot of students of color stay in the local area, right? So they go to the closest college. And if Harvey Mudd's close to you, I want you to come to us, right? And so uh, we bring them to campus every year uh, for, a, for a, a STEM conference and have been featured in Forbes magazine for the, the, the outreach that we do to girls in our community, get them engaged in hands-on activities uh, around STEM. And the day involves sort of each young lady having her time on the microphone, um, mentorship, sort of personal mentorship at a, at a, you know, with, with a woman of color, and then also uh, sessions by women who talk about their research and their job and how it involves STEM. And so the goal here, this is a one day, it's one Saturday, like it's not earth shadowing, but it's giving them an image of what they can become. Right, it's giving them a Claudia to hold on to so that they can see someone who looks like them who's done it. What about some national solutions? So, so here's where I've started to work more broadly is really you know, how can I help be a voice for STEM empowerment in the, in the country? Um, I've got a book that I'm, that's coming out in April, Power in Numbers, The Rebel Women of Mathematics. I didn't want the word rebel. I had women mathematicians with attitude. Get it, ad? Yeah, that's what they said. They were like. <laughs> Like, it's so punny. Attitude, mathematicians. They were like, mm. <laughs> nobody's going to buy that. I was like, I would totally buy Yeah. Um, the rebel, went, you know, rebel is like, oh, yeah, tell me about those rebellious. I'm like, they weren't rebellious. They were just regular women. I was just, okay. All right. It is what it is. Um, I've given this TED talk. It was actually a TEDx talk for those faculty in the room. If there's a local TED event, do it, because you never know when it might get upgraded. Over 1.4 million views. A million of those are my mom on a different computer. <laughs> I love her. I appreciate all that she does to make me be successful. Uh, and, but that's one way to help broaden, right, STEM appeal to the masses. I, I, get, I just got an email today from someone who was like, I saw your TED Talk, and I think I'll start collecting my data. That's great. Awesome. Right? How can we think about ways to take our research, to take our work to the masses, and not just sort of keep it cooped up Right, in the, with the five people that can understand what we're doing. This great courses lecture, um, I just did, you can get this for free, because you, yeah, you're on a budget, don't know. Uh, if you download the Great Courses Plus, you get the first month free, cancel at day 28. Cut that out, cut that out. Cancel at day 28. You can watch all of them, you can watch tons of others, and then cancel. Um, if you do want to purchase it, I was able to get a priority discount code. So if you're interested, if you've seen the great courses before, uh, they're sort of hands-on, interactive, fun lectures. Um, was the first black woman to ever give a great courses lecture. Yes. 
Is it, it's our like, what? Really? Nobody else? Yeah. So, so, so 24, um, and those 68 percent, whatever, whatever. Come on, man. Um, and then, lastly, uh, I'll, I'll conclude here. Um, I'm excited to be hosting a new Nova series that comes out in April uh, called Nova Wonders. And this has really been a stretch for me uh, because it's involved things like, you know, audio recording and and you know, television. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm just briefly going to introduce Amal El Ghazali. Um, she's a postdoctoral scholar in the Jeff Boker Group in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and she's our question and answer moderator for today. So first of all, thank you so much for, for the talk. It was incredibly fun to listen to, and I hope You're it was welcome. fun to yeah, give as well. Fun. You guys were a lively evening audience. <laughs> Um, so the first question I wanted to ask was uh, specifically about your experience in all these different institutions. Mm -hmm. So you've been in the historically black colleges and universities, both the small one, which is Spelman, and Howard, mm -hmm. which is larger. And, and a women's college. Yeah. And a women's college, true. Um, and you've gone to Rice, which I guess is considered more of a predominantly white institution. So mm -hmm. from your experience at all these institutions, and, and Harvey Mudd now, what do you suggest, or what differences do you see, and what do you suggest could be improved to make the more inclusive environment in PWIs? Yeah, so I, I think part of the difference, so, so when I went to Spelman, um, there's something intangible about going to an institution that was created for you. And you feel it. I mean, I felt it from everyone that I interacted with on, their, on that campus that they were there to serve and care for black women. And, um, and e even getting to Howard, it was a little different. Rice, it was clear that I was a, I was a guest in this space. I sort of felt more like a guest. Not that, you know, nothing they were doing bad, it's just a different feeling. And so um, I think sometimes majority students, you know, own a space differently than students who sort of don't feel like it was created for them. Because a lot of our institutions, when you look at, the, look at our histories, were not. Uh, created for women and then weren't created for, for people of color. And so, um, I, I, you know, I, I think Safe Spaces has sort of gotten a, a you know, a, a, a bad name, but often it helps to create spaces where students can come and, and relax because you carry a weight that you're always on. I felt like at Rice I was always on, like, you know, people sort of see me and they see the entire black race. And so I can't do anything crazy because See, I told you, those black women. <laughs> Spellman, I could walk around in my pajamas and like nobody cared, you know, they were like, oh, whatever. And so, um, and, and so I think it helps to have those spaces for students to come together and be intentional and then recognize how we can really create a welcoming environment on our, on our campus, yeah. Great, well that leads really well into the next question. So how do you approach like self-care of yourself regardless of the environment? Um, uh, spa day, mani pedi. <laughs> um, I, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, um, I love spending time with my family. We, we homeschool. We homeschooler. Everybody was homeschool. Well, you're, my mom and parents sent you. Yes, yay! There's a homeschooler. Um, so yeah, so we homeschool our kids. We, we really enjoy spending quality time uh, with them. Part of that is because I travel a lot, and so I like to take them with me when I go places to speak. And um, it, having a family means that there has to be a cutoff. And so, um, you know, I have to go home at four because, you know, the, the kids need care. And so I think part of my self-care is just in response to the other parts of my life that have to have space and making sure yeah. that I have space for them. As a result of that, um, being a woman and taking care of a family or being a woman of color, have you ever had to experience microaggressions in the workspace. Um, oh, look at the time. <laughs> oh, you know what? Um, not we don't have time for question. any questions. So thank you for coming out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, you can choose not to no, answer. No, 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 no. That's a good question. Um, um, well, how did, how did you navigate that situation? You can tell us about the experience or not, um, but maybe how do you navigate sure, microaggressions? Sure. OK, I'll tell you about an experience as a, as a graduate student. So um, my my fourth year in my PhD program, I went to a statistics conference at, uh, in Chicago, University of, Ch Chicago, University of uh, at Northwestern was hosting, and it was at this hotel. And it was my first time sort of going without my advisor. I was really excited to 
you know, be, become, be becoming a statistician, a budding statistician. And so uh, I get on the elevator. There, there's a, a white gentleman on the elevator. And I sort of get in. And I'm like, hey, good morning. And he was like, hello. <laughs> I'm going to the basement level. Me too. I'm going <laughs> to the basement. You know. And so uh, we go to the basement. And then we walk up to the table, the registration table. And the woman looks up. And she looks at both of us. She looks at him. She looks at me. And she's like, are you at the right conference? Because there's another one down the hall. And he was sort of like, like, yeah. And I'm like, I can read. It says statistics. You know. And so I was like, oh, that was weird. Um, and so I got my name tag, and I went over to the, to the uh, breakfast line. An elevator dude comes over, and he glances and looks at my name tag. And he said, oh, you're at Rice University. Do you know David Scott? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, I had a class with him last semester. But in the elevator, you couldn't talk to me. And somehow this name, this badge was validation that we could have a conversation. Um, and so that's just sort of one incident of, of even before I get, this is breakfast, day one, mm -hmm. right? So I didn't get anything out of that experience. Because the whole time I'm sitting here thinking, like, well, who else thinks I shouldn't be? Who else thinks I'm in the wrong Place, you know, and it's not like the NAACP was down the hall. Like it was just a conference that had more diversity than the one I was at, but it wasn't, you know, a conference for Black women. And so um, there's several of those. I mean, that's just sort of one, but there's several of those little bitty things that that when you look at them, you can sort of say, well, she didn't really know. And it's like, yeah, but it. I tell you today, like it happened yesterday. And it feels like it happened. It feels like, you know, and, and, and it took me a long time to realize that her view of my ability is not my view of my ability. Right? But we lose a lot of people who have that experience and then say, you know what? I don't have to, I don't have to you know, go through this. Um, and so that's just sort of one example of, you know, how do you, how do you take those aggressions? You know, because it was sort of macro, right? It was, it was a big deal. And how do you grow from that? And how do you not lose? sight of what you're passionate about and excited about because of someone else's opinion. Um, mm -hmm. When I first started teaching at Harvey Mudd, you know, I love my students, uh, but I got a lot of questions. And I'm like, oh, these guys, they're so inquisitive, they, you know. And I would tell my colleagues, oh, I, you know, I'm having trouble getting through my lecture because I get so many questions. And my senior male colleagues were like, what do you mean you get a lot of questions? They're like, oh, these students, oh, let me tell you, they are just, woo. And uh, he said, let, let, let me sit in on one of your lectures. Yeah, I'd love to have you, you know, because I, I got to speed up, right? And so he sat in, and older white male colleague, and he said, they're not asking you questions. They're questioning you. And I said, what? Because I was like encouraging. Oh, yeah, everybody, you know? And he was like, no, next time someone asks a question, just say, oh, that's a great question. Let's talk about it after class. I need to get through the lecture. And so he had, to, he had to come in and see. I didn't even see that, right? I'm just like, oh, whew, this class is a buzz. And he's like, no, my class is, no, no, I don't, I don't get these same questions. I've taught this before. These, these are questions to see if you know what you're doing. Right? And, so, and so I don't know. I mean, I think our department has been intentional in recognizing that students are going to come with their own bias. And how do we help mitigate that? Instead of, I don't know why your evaluations are so low. Right, sort of recognizing and then giving me tools to be successful in that environment. Yeah, that's really great that your peer could come in and do oh, that for right. you and show you. Because had he not, yeah. you know, I'd, to this day, I'd be in there answering questions. Trying to... so, <laughs> so going back to the, the first story that sure. you said, though, as a graduate student, what, what do you think you could have done going back to your professor to help them see the equity and Sure. Yeah. I call my professor right after, you know, because I'm like partly balling. I'm like, oh. And she's like, what's her name? Write her name down. And I'm like, no, I'm a big girl, you know. Um, and so I think in the moment, I probably, and this is what I would do now when that comes up, is to sort of say, oh, tell me what you mean by that. Right? So sort of put it back on other people to give them an opportunity to explain or to, get, to let them see their bias. Like, I don't think. She wasn't like, how can I ruin this black girl? You know, I, she was just like, oh, you probably don't belong here. You must be down the hall, right? So how could I have put the question back on her and asked her to clarify? Because then it's like, well, I looked at you and thought you, 
You know, and so, so putting people in, in the position where they have to respond instead of let me justify why I'm here, um, help me understand why you think I shouldn't be here. Yeah. Right? And so then get, and letting them sort of grow from that and not, not getting upset about it, just sort of recognizing that people are at different levels and how can we sort of help move them, you know, one step right. further. Yeah. Is it possible, do you have recommendations for us as graduate students and postdocs to also help our own faculty expand their view and be more inclusive? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you in a <laughs> tough spot. Great question. <laughs> um, Uh, so I think it helps if there's someone in the department who can, who's an advocate, who's sort of already on your side. Uh, so at Rice, my advisor, who was also the department chair, was, was woke, right? She sort of understood, because I'd be like, Kathy, you know. Uh, but I felt like I could go to her when I had other issues or when other students had issues with other faculty. They could sort of go to her as an advocate, and then she could come in in her role Right? Instead of us coming in in sort of a, a role where there could be retribution, um, how can you find someone who might advocate on your behalf? The same thing with students at, at Harvey Mudd. You know, um, not every professor is like Prof. Williams. And so when you get someone who wonders how you got here, how do we navigate that in a way that, that the student is going to be comfortable with, but then also I can step in as a colleague, um, or I can just put them in another section. <laughs> Right, so I think that, I think we have advocates that we have to reach out to because it's a you know you don't want to not finish your PhD because you outed some professor, uh, but sometimes there are things that you you know that 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 you you need to get out to somebody. So it helps to either have an ombudsman or someone on campus that you can share that with. Great. Um, and then how do we get to the point where, like in your second story, where our majority peers are the ones who are helping us? That's a great point. Um, one thing I did, so when I, when I first got to Rice, I was the only woman and the only African American in my first year cohort. And I was just like, oh, okay, well, gosh, this is interesting. And, uh, and people had sort of grouped off, right? The Asians were together, the Indians were together. The, you know. and, and I didn't have a group. And so uh, the first week of classes, I sent an email to the other guys. And I was like, hey, you know, Wednesdays, we're going to do first year lunch, and then we're going to do homework in the stat library. Let me know how many people you can take in your car. Nice. And so they replied back, like, oh, I can take three people. I don't have a car, but I need to ride with somebody. And so I was like, oh, sure, sure, sure. Or we're going to meet here at this time. We'd go eat, and then we'd, we'd all matriculate back to the stat library, and we would do homework together. Because it appeared like that was just like, that's official. First week, oh, apparently that's what first years do. <laughs> and so um, they didn't know. Right? I'm like, I need a study group. I will invite everyone. Um, and so two days before when, so Monday, I would work all the homework problems. I would like, you know, Google, whatever. I'd come, you know. And then we'd all sit down Wednesday. They hadn't looked at homework. Or it's not due till Friday. And so they'd be like, oh, what do you guys think about number one? I was like, I don't, I'm not sure. You know, well, I, well, I have an idea. I, <laughs> maybe if we try. And so then I'd sort of work, and then I'd get to the, almost to the end, and then I'm like, I'm not really, oh, oh, oh. And then I'd sit down, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, that totally thing that looks good. Oh, yeah, just, just <laughs> doing my part. Hey, you know, we all got to get this homework done. And so I did, so like the first three weeks, that was me, you know, and just going up, you know, pretending like I was thinking of this on the spot. Because I wanted them to see that I brought value, yeah. Yeah. right? Because you can look at the person of color and think like, uh, I'm going to be trying to help bring you along. I was like, I wanted them to see that I'm bringing them along. I'm happy to work with you. I'm happy to bring you along if you don't know how to solve this problem. Right, by week, week four, when it's like, I really don't know how to solve the problem, I'm like, Shuhan, you know, what do you think? You want to give it a go? And they're like, sure, yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah, you, I'll just, you know, let somebody share the space. Right? And so I, where that idea came from, I have no idea. But I knew that I needed, I wasn't going to be successful without a group. Yeah. And I knew that people weren't going to necessarily want to be in my group. And so I needed to create a group and, and create the appearance of them wanting to, to be a part. We were the closest group, one of the closest uh, classes that had come through Rice. 
to the point where the chair was just like, what is it with these first? Like, you guys are always together. We're like, yeah, we're just buds like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we work together every Wednesday on homework, you know? Um, and so, and so it, I had to be intentional in creating a community because at that point, you know, as a, as a teacher, as an instructor, I can pair students. I can say, oh, work together, everybody. Graduate school, people are grown. People don't have to work with you. They don't have to be nice to you. They don't have to show you what the qualifying exam was last year. Right? And so I needed to build that community and didn't have help to do it. Right? No one can be like, here's how you make friends and influence people in grad school. It's like, get through it. Right? Um, and so I think a lot of students of color come to, to an environment and, have, and are faced with that. In addition to just the difficulty of grad school, how do you create a, a community where you can be successful? So you, you just led into the next question, exactly that. So the, um, one of the difficulties in grad school is, is the imposter syndrome, feeling like the diversity, or the students who come in as the diversity mm -hmm. are only there because they are that. Um, so how do you create an environment where that's not the case? Yeah, that never goes away. Okay. <laughs> so next I mean, question. It, I mean, it, it doesn't, right? I mean, I, I still feel it at times. Mm -hmm. um, I felt my qualifying exams the first time I took them. And I had U-Haul on speed dial. I was like, just come get my stuff. I'm going home. Uh, and so I just sort of felt like, you know, they found out that I really couldn't make it, you know? Um, I don't know that it ever goes away. And, and it's not always an outside force. Sometimes it's just an internal force of what we see. I don't think I ever felt like an, an imposter at Spelman because I had these unconscious images of these other women who were always around me, who looked like me, who were successful. Yeah. And I think when I stepped out of that environment and I didn't have that imagery, I would sort of question things. And if I, if I failed an exam at Spelman, I failed because I partied all night, or because I, you know, not because I was a black woman, because look at these black women that passed. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got to an environment where I, I stood out, I was like, maybe I failed because I was a woman. <gasps> maybe I failed because I'm African American. You know, and then it's like, so then these are my own mental thoughts. No one's saying you failed because, right? Mentally, I didn't see that affirmation around me. And then I said, well, then there must be something wrong with me. And, and I think it's just, you know, how do you get over that? I think that's a daily struggle that a lot of people deal with. So when we're trying to encourage faculty and departments to embrace diversity and bring more in, um, how do we separate the act of doing that fr um, from affirmative action? So it's more that we want to create an inclusive environment and remove stigma from um, embracing yeah. diversity. So how do you suggest to <laughs> These are tough questions. Um, I think what Mr. Dorman did, right, he reaffirmed every student in the class. It wasn't just like the little brown kids. You know, every student, he was like, you have the ability to be a math major, you should think about majoring in math. And um, I, think, I think we can do that for everybody. And in doing that for everybody, you bring everybody along. Um, when you think about resources that have, that have, that have been used on campus, so even uh, counseling resources, uh, mental health resources, they benefit all students. They disproportionately benefit students who, you know, who struggle with mental health issues, but they also benefit students who may not or who are sort of starting to begin to see those issues. And so um, I think when we think about inclusion and diversity, when we can really broaden that to the entire student body, right, everybody wins. And then it's not just, oh, you're just doing this for the women. It's, I'm doing this for everybody. It's going to help everybody, but it's also going to disproportionately uh, help in a positive way those underrepresented groups. So what you're saying is make the story known of why diversity. Absolutely, absolutely. And then encourage everybody to come to the table, right? How do we invite people to the table? Um, often in mathematics, you know, we think there's a certain type of mathematician and there's a certain caliber of person who can do mathematics. And if you can't, you do psychology, you do socio, like you do something else, right? And so how do we create uh, gateways to our disciplines that are different from just, you need to go through calculus. Like, calculus? Like, is that the only way to be a math major? Why can't we do discrete math, right? There are other types of mathematics that ought to be able to bring people into the major instead of you will do the, exactly what I did 60 years ago. And so I, I, I think if we were more broad, we would bring a lot more people, not just students of color and women. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. You guys are so welcome. This is great. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs>